Hello, and welcome to the Tech Dirt Podcast. I'm Mike Masnick. The world is increasingly technological, so we have better get methodical. Bringing precision to critical digital journalism with the singular vision of the modern monocle. Stopping the copyright bullies from pulling the wall on us. Facing and taking on all the plates to pay to troll. Document the ways that they aim to take control. Scrutinizing through their lies and make them fall. If we don't stand up to them, someone will get hurt. To grab a shovel and dig up the tech. If we don't stand up to them, someone will get hurt. To grab a shovel and dig up the tech. We talk a lot about copyright and patent issues on Tech Dirt, and one of the most frustrating arguments that I hear back from some people is that without copyrights and patents, no one would ever create or invent anything. In fact, I've heard politicians directly parrot this line, claiming that intellectual property is the only way to incentivize these kinds of things. Or, as I recently heard, a UK politician announce that without intellectual property, there are no business models available. Hopefully, everyone listening to this podcast recognizes that this is an obvious myth. Tons of creativity and inventiveness and innovation has happened without copyright or patents ever being around. And, of course, we also show plenty of examples of both patents and copyright sometimes getting in the way or hindering creativity and innovation. But there's a larger point here. I think many of us agree that it's a good thing to provide incentives for innovation and for creativity and think that we should be looking for ways to encourage that kind of activity, even if we're not sure that copyright and patents are the best way to do so. So today's discussion is going to be about alternative models to copyright and patents to act as incentives to create and innovate. I will kick it off with just two quick examples, and then we can go from there. First, I think we've already seen how crowdfunding is a very viable alternative for creativity and innovation. While obviously many now use copyright and patents in combination with crowdfunding, others have realized that by focusing on the crowdfunding portion, it allows them not to worry about the intellectual property questions making sure that they can make enough directly from supporters who often can be more loyal anyway. The second example is more focused on the innovation side, and that's been an increasing focus lately on things like innovation prizes, such as the Ansari X Prize for doing private spaceflight launches. These kinds of, prize, uh, of prizes still give a windfall to those who get there first, but without necessarily tying up the first successful uh, entrant, uh, entrance ideas with patents and blocking out important follow-on innovations from others. I wanted to talk about the viability of these and also other alternatives with our regular crew of Dennis Yang and Hirsch Reddy. And I'm going to start with Hirsch since he's always very vocal on intellectual property issues. And uh, let's start with you. Do you have a favorite alternative uh, to, to intellectual property, or do you think that question is even worth asking? Um, do I have a favorite alternative? Um, I don't think I've, I've ever ranked them. I mean, I'm definitely a fan <laughs> of I'm definitely a fan of using alternative methods, as you guys know from earlier podcasts. I uh, think there's a huge burden on entrepreneurs with the current system, but I don't know if I would do away with it completely. Maybe I would. I'm yeah, trying to and, think, and I'm not even saying. Yeah. And again, I mean, crowdfunding and and X prizes and things like that. They they don't, you know, they work perfectly well in combination. Um, but you know, I wanted to think about just to get past this idea that you absolutely need uh, because the, the the problem. Let me take a step back. The problem I think is that when people think that the only possible business model is because of patents or because of copyright, the incentives then are to always ratchet those upwards, mm-hmm. and we recognize clearly that that creates problems. And so, the more that we can focus on these alternatives and give people the choices to you know use those alternatives and then decide whether that has to be in combination with or separate from the intellectual property side, the more interesting debates I think that we can have over, you know, what models make the most sense. So here's the problem I have with prizes. And and if we were looking at the two options you gave, I might prefer crowdfunding. The problem Mm -hmm. I have with prizes is that um, it basically sets 
the goals that everyone has to go towards. Sure. If, if someone can't imagine the gold or if someone, someone with sufficient money can't imagine the gold, then there's no incentive. Whereas mm-hmm. with crowdfunding, somebody with a project can go out there, put it in front of the world and say, you guys want this and thereby create uh, the incentive to actually develop Yeah, and, it. and I, think, I think that's a good point, which is that different models work in different situations. And I, I think you know, prizes work where there is a big, clear goal that people know that they want to accomplish something. So, so the obvious ones, obviously, like you know, the space flight one. There've been prizes around like autonomous vehicles, also. And then the other area that people talk about a lot is pharmaceuticals, right? So, yeah. if you want to create a drug that will, you know, cure AIDS or cancer or whatever, um, and you want to make sure that that drug will be more widely available in the long run, you could make an argument that a prize solution could be a lot better than a patented solution. Well, it, it kind of depends, though, right? Like, when you look at the way sort of national health organizations or DARPA fund long-term projects, mm-hmm. um, that makes it a lot easier to conduct long-term research than setting up a prize. A prize is paid out after success. Mm-hmm. And so, to some extent, the teams that are shooting for the prize have to get together their own capital to pursue the goal, right? Mm-hmm. And... It's, it's certainly possible, you know, with, with a good financial system like we have in the United States, for for you to get a team together, for people to vet you, and then for somebody who's a capital provider to say, hey, they have a good chance of going after the prize, and though it's not a hundred percent chance they'll get the prize, I think it's high enough that I will stake them with this amount of money. And it's like any other entrepreneurial activity in that sense, right? So, but that certainly has a lot more friction to it that process, and there's a lot more uncertainty to it than um, when you fund it from sort of the bottom up, sort yep. of the, the, the DARPA style or the, or the National Health Institute style. So DARPA's done prizes too, actually. DARPA's done prizes too, but they also do a huge amount of just sort of... Yeah, just, sure. You know, no, and, and, that's, and that's a really good point where it's like, you know, with the, with the prizes, I think you probably do still need an, an additional other business model on top of it. And you look at like, right, the space prize, right? I mean, it was won by the team that is now Virgin Galactic. Mm-hmm. And yet, and it was not won, even though there was, you know, some attempts by SpaceX. They were looking yeah. into that and they didn't win. But now if you look and you say sort of who's leading the private space race right now, it's probably SpaceX. They didn't suffer from not winning the X Prize, right? They had. Mm-hmm. But, but did the X, I mean, I feel like the, when, when the, the prize is concerned, it feels like one of those things where it, it's, it's just like, it feels like a big science like improvement or, mm-hmm. or some sort of a thing where we think it's really important to do but maybe the short-term incremental business kind of milestones yeah. are not there. And something like, like, I mean, like the pharmaceutical stuff where a cure for certain, for, for certain diseases like, say, malaria or something mm-hmm. are actually not, they don't look like great businesses to, to a lot of pharma companies, right? Because, you know, they, the, like a drug that kind of treats a chronic condition and you're kind of taking it for the rest of your life, right? And covered by health insurance, and is actually, I think, much more profit like profitable sure. than like a malaria cure, right? So, and I think that it's important to have prizes to fund those types of innovations that are actually good good for. Maybe it's not they haven't quite figured out the the real business model, but we know from a societal thing it's good. Or on the in the case of the space thing, maybe the the space the SpaceX prize did actually kind of jumpstart that whole industry with, you know, yeah. Virgin, we have teams from Virgin and teams from SpaceX kind of competing and it, and it kind of lays that groundwork from the colleges that are working in the X prize to, you know, the companies that are, and, and now, you know, arguably that, that pr- the private commercial space industry is, is doing, it seems to be doing pretty well or, or at least. Growing. Yeah. And a lot so, of it really did sort of come together around that X prize. Yeah. So it may have spurred it, may, it yeah. spurred it forward. And the, the DARPA autonomous vehicle thing, mm-hmm. I'm, Guessing that people that worked on that in college are now working on a lot of autonomous vehicle projects, right? So, like, I know that I worked on, um, you know, a hybrid electric vehicle project at, in college, and a lot of the my my teammates that went on and actually are working on hybrid vehicles at the, at a time where, you know, I remember speaking with people in the automotive industry, and they laughed. This is back in the late '90s. They laughed at us. They're like, "What? Like, that's not a that's not a, <laughs> a viable like model, right?" Which, which maybe maybe says why you know Toyota came out with a much better hybrid vehicles than, than Detroit did. But, you know, and that, but I thought that was really important to have that kind of prize there. It wasn't a million-dollar prize at that time. Um, but it inspired. But it inspired, and it also gave kind of, especially for colleges, right? Like, there was, we were working towards a competition, and it wasn't a big monetary prize, but it gave us a reason to do it. Um, 
because we felt like it was important. We just haven't quite figured out the business model yet, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, it does give give people something to reach for. I mean, I, I guess you know there is also the question like when you have a prize like that, you know, it only goes to the winner effectively, right? And so everybody might put in the work, and then you, but that's okay because you yeah. all win. That's the thing. Like we didn't win mm-hmm. the you know our eight, our eight, the hybrid vehicle contest. We did okay, but we didn't win it. Mm-hmm. But I learned a ton. Like all my all my teammates learned a ton, and that was. Like it's a net win. Like it, we weren't actually there to win the prize. We were there to to do something, right? And, and then show and and know. the prize was just a nice incentive. Yeah, it was. It like there's a reason to 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 do the to create what you're creating, and you're kind of doing it because you say it's because of the prize, but really at the end of the day, like you're doing it because you get to work right. But the, I could thing, see how the so. prize would at least, you know, even if you were interested in like you know hybrid electric vehicles or something, the prize could help you strive to reach certain milestones sure. that otherwise you would you yeah. probably would not have even bothered with. Yeah, I mean, competition it, is really like look at like how much we achieve versus someone that was just working in their lab by themselves. Like we were pushing towards a deadline, we were pushing to beat other teams, and right, you know, competition is exciting. I mean, that was what like Jack Welch classically, you know, would would create two teams within GE to work on the same project because you, right. you work better when you know someone else is trying trying to beat you. Yeah, creating creating competition is always good. If if your worry is that that the other teams will have a large dead weight sort of loss from not getting the prize and mm-hmm. and perhaps that would be insurmountable, one way you could solve that is by having smaller incremental prizes sure. uh, that work rather than one large one, which might seem a little less interesting. Like, so for example, if you're working on a hybrid electric vehicle, you could have a, a smaller, like, you know, electrical subsystem prize that has to fulfill a certain, you know, criteria. Actually, a battery prize. Yeah. You know, there, right. there you go, or or a lightweight chassis prize. You know, different prizes like that. Right. But it, another thing I wanted to say is the cool thing about prizes versus sort of the the uh, the blanket funding of labs, which is the other way we do research in the United States. Mm -hmm. The cool thing about prizes is there's less bureaucracy and there's less politics involved with it. You don't have to be a good political player because your results show you to be the winner. Whereas when it comes to anything where a bunch of bureaucrats have to select which labs are going to get the money, Mm -hmm. um, even if you call those bureaucrats government scientists or whatever, at the end of the day, they're playing a bureaucratic role. They're divvying up the money amongst these, quote unquote, famous professors. And that ends up, a lot of times the money goes to people that that aren't actually producing or doing the work. Their grad students are doing the work, but they're but they, their name is attracting the money, and so they are essentially free riding on the system by not doing a lot of work. So that kind of thing is eliminated in prize teams, not completely, but to a much right, larger there may extent. be some, but if the as long yeah. as the prize rules are clear, but and and then I mean if you go back to again, this is sort of a, another reason why you know patents can be a negative issue, where there is a, a ton of bureaucratic mess in terms of getting a patent and and the time and resources that you have to spend to get the patent and to convince the patent office and, and then to enforce the patent if you're going to do that as well. Um, you know, whereas a prize is just very, very clean. Yeah. And then again, obviously with the patent, all the intermediate results are locked up in a thicket of patents. Whereas right. in an open prize system, it, especially if you make it a precursor to getting the prize, the requirement that you have to donate some right. amount of your intellectual property to the public, uh, to the commons essentially, then... You know, you basically free up the, you free up the space. So yeah, and you're and and not not just free up the space, but you're encouraging sort of follow on innovations right. um, from others who you know might take it in a different direction, which could potentially lead to more social value. Um, so let's let's jump over to the sort of crowdfunding issue. Do we do we think that crowdfunding is is you know I mean I think you know Kickstarter is huge and now there's you know a ton of others obviously you know Indiegogo and GoFundMe and all those those kinds of things and and tons of content and you know products are now being funded through crowdfunding. There have been certainly some um, hiccups and stumbles <laughs> and it's not perfect, but it is not perfect. Um, but it does seem for at least a class of of um, projects to be a viable alternative. I think it's more than viable. I think it's a 
outright success now. I think there's there's yeah. so many kinds of consumer electronics sort of hardware projects. Not just that, but there's with, everything. Right? There's yeah. everything, yeah. but but specifically, I like hardware because those sorts of startup projects weren't really practical in the past, right? Yeah, like, I mean, it's to the, some extent, it's crowdfunding. It's not only the sort of the capital from crowdfunding, but it's the exposure from crowdfunding sites yeah. and that early adopter enthusiasm that really. Uh, makes it so that hardware companies don't need to, well, first of all, they get the capital, but then they don't need to spend the additional capital to, to do marketing. They get yeah. so much social it's, viral Yeah, the, the marketing that, aspect so. of crowdfunding is often one that's, that's you, know, not, you know, not as widely recognized, but I think it's a key point. And I think we've really seen an explosion of hardware startups in the last like five years, and I think that a large part of that has to be attributable to the rise of crowdfunding. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think with that explosion, though, we've also seen some of the downsides of crowdfunding, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Which is, and one of the big ones is because of the lack of quality curation, you have people pitching ridiculous devices, yep. which, which experts know can't exist, but, but the layperson doesn't necessarily. But I think know that, that I mean that's that that is part what how how crowdfunding is supposed to work is that. If it's ridiculous, it's not supposed to get funded, right? But, like, but there are ridiculous some, projects yeah. that no, do. Right. And then there's the other aspect, which is not even going that far. And I, I mean, that's a point that is definitely an issue. But even, you know, the legitimate projects that people, you know, the execution on a project is always more difficult than people expect. And yeah. the vast majority of, of crowdfunding I, projects that I've backed have been delivered late. Sure. But I, but I think that because crowd, crowdfunding basically gives you a signal as to whether or not the market wants your product, yeah. right? It does not give you a signal as far as like whether or not your product is possible to be built. Right, right? or even if you're good at or building. If you're good at building, right? Yeah. So, the, so I think that that's, you know, crowdfunding is a fantastic way. Like, for example, if you put up a project and nobody wanted it, then that's a really, really cheap way of not wasting your time yeah, it's, and money It's a to market make research it, tool. Which is awesome, right? Yeah. So, um, but I think that maybe there needs to be a better kind of vetting on that second half, which is, you know, okay, now that this is actually possible, um, you know, oh, now, that I, now that people want this, now that it, you only fund it if it's possible, or if you only fund it if, get the, if it gets delivered, or I don't know. Well, I, I think some of this risk that comes post-funding uh, can be um, reduced a little bit by having a more, mat- as the system gets more mature, by having these teams that are experts in executing different phases of the project. So we already see some of that with people that will be your hardware partners that will set up your manufacturing in China or, right. or the United States or wherever. They'll set up the yeah. whole process. They'll figure out how to uh, take a particular design and actually mass produce it, you know, things like that. They'll help you with that. So that's one aspect of it. But you can also, you can think, of teams sort of moving up the value chain a little bit, and mm-hmm. people and having people that are basically like uh, uh, design commandos for hire. Right. Right? It's kind of like you have this like high level concept, and you crowdfund it, but they'll actually help you with the actual physical design and and, and yeah. You and know, you could and see sort like of that. like so, people will will be encouraged to sort of bring on people who have done exactly. successful or projects. Or teams, teams yeah. with reputations, just like yeah. a seller on eBay or whatever. Here's a yeah. team that has a reputation for bringing products reliably to market, and they have joined forces with this. Yeah. And, 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 then, then you, and then you know, okay, this is going to happen. And, and I think we should take a step back, too, and, and admit that, like, you know, of course not all the projects are going to work, but, like, then look at the alternative, and it's like, you know, under the copyright system, you know, lots or, or patents for, for hardware things, like, Lots of products get funded and then fail, right? And so, but the, but the consumer doesn't bear the right. Risk so that's that that's case. the difference in terms of who who bears the risk, you know. But and then there's just a question of you know, but but how much risk, right? So the nice thing about crowdfunding is that you're spreading out the risk so that any single yeah. consumer isn't betting like a huge portion of their income on it. Yeah. But what what happens when a project does? Have you been a part of a project that has absolutely failed? Like uh, late is okay. Not great. Yeah. Well, I mean, and there's one project that I'm beginning to that's to wonder. I'm beginning to wonder if it's yeah. ever actually going to get delivered. But even there was one that I waited for like two and a half years, and I did finally get it. It was a piece of crap once I got it. Yeah. But um, but that's different. Yeah. I than, mean, it, it is it is ridiculous. Other. I mean, not, maybe not ridiculous, but it's it's kind of sad how how poor the estimates sometimes are on Kickstarter projects. Sure. Like Absolutely. One of my friends and, bought a pair of dice. <laughs> and he was like, this is going to be a slam dunk. And I think after <laughs> nine months, finally, it was, it was a good idea. <laughs> uh, dice? <laughs> yeah, it was uh, drinking dice. So basically, you take any six-sided dice game, it turns it into an eight-sided dice, and then you throw two drinking 
Um, Symbols in so it. it turns any game with dice into a drinking game. Well, that sounds <laughs> it's like a good an idea. alcohol extreme. Yeah, but um, but I mean, and the FTC actually just cracked down on um, one failed Kickstarter project, uh, and and went after the company for for misspending the money and never producing yeah. the product. And so, you know, it's it's possible that you could have you know whether it's a government or, or some other entity come in and try and clean up some of that. But I, I think it's you know. But, yeah, like, will you have to put, like, a bond or something in order for it to... It's, it's possible, right? Like You, you, could, you could see you arguments could secure, for... Yeah, secure a project with a certain amount of refund possibility, or maybe that's actually a feature of a Kickstarter project that says, hey, we're putting up a bond that says one right. third of your money might come back to you if we actually fail, so, or you something. Know, well, you know, one way to solve this is actually to put more uh, of a requirement for due diligence on the users, to, to have more sophisticated users, and one way of doing that... Because that's going to work. It, <laughs> one way of doing that, and this actually works in other markets, one way of doing that is by offering a reward to users that's different than just getting the product by saying you get some equity or something, right? Yeah. And, and, and which that's something which raises other issues. Exactly. There's a lot of regulations against it now. But if there, there, I mean, Wait, specifically, the Jobs Act was to liberalize this. Absolutely. And, and, and it hasn't fully been implemented. No, exactly. But, but that's the kind of thing where if you have a huge influx of capital from very smart crowdfunders essentially right like who are yeah. investors then they will do a lot more due diligence and they'll create the market for the kinds of things that we're talking about and i don't and, and the market won't just be those teams i'm talking about it will also be people that are very good at doing due diligence of teams right, right? And all those kinds of rating agencies micro raters and stuff yeah. like that that'll all come about if there's enough capital coming in and enough of a demand from sophisticated yeah, users it'd be, be interesting you could have you know like a you know, Kickstarter rating agency. Exactly. Um, which would be, yeah, that, would, that would be kind well, of interesting. Well, imagine this. You crowdfund, and then the person <laughs> who's being crowdfunded pays for a raider. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or, or if you think that's a conflict of interest, maybe it's Kickstarter itself kicks in the money and says, hey, we're hosting the platform, so we're going to pay for this raider yeah. or this group Yeah, I mean, you could, you could even see, see it where, you know, the amount of money that, you know, right now you kick back a certain amount to Kickstarter, right? But you could you could change the kickback amount depending on or if you have the rating. Would you well. would you pay an extra premium for like a Kickstarter insurance? I like, don't know. Like you know, I if know. I if I'm if I'm kickstarting a product for a hundred bucks, you know, kicking like another one or two dollars if this product does not deliver by a certain date or doesn't deliver or whatever, yeah. you get your money back. Or something. So, I think that would be an interesting way. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like if I were to create a Kickstarter rating agency, that's how I would I would actually build the business around that. Right? Yeah, so, insurance policy. Yeah, that's an yeah. interesting. And way then to do it. you know, and, and and there are other. I mean, like I'll buy your contract. Basically, you you have a hundred dollar contract with this company, right? To deliver a product by a certain date, I'll buy that contract to, from you for a dollar and. Right, yeah. you can buy it for pennies on the dollar, <laughs> um, and you know, and we're very. It's not fun. a contract, by the way. Well, whatever. It's All right, yeah, fine. But, <laughs> but <laughs> which, which one of us is a lawyer? <laughs> but, but you know what? It would be interesting to make it a contract, but you know, yeah. now it starts to get more complicated. That, there's there's a reason they've structured it. Well, let, let's let's take this yeah. step back here. So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and we've been on the crowdfunding side. We've been very focused on kind of the Kickstarter model, and there are a bunch of clones on that. But there are other things yeah. as well, right? I mean, there's like Patreon, right? Which is also crowdfunding, but mm -hmm. that is that takes away some of that risk because then you're just paying for, you know, delivery of something, some sort of serialized item that is delivered, and therefore you get that same kind of yeah. thing that you were talking about, where you don't have to worry about committing this huge amount of money up front. You're just committing per delivery, effectively, right? And so, you know, that could be per song or per video or per podcast or something like like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know it seems to be a model that's catching on for for certain, especially for certain kinds of content. Yeah, um, and I think that that's really interesting that we're seeing. There's another like model which both. which I haven't seen, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if it would fly in the United States. It might not fly with the way our culture works. But imagine an artist produces an album, mm -hmm. and they set the amount of money that they want to make, and they say people just keep donating. And when when the cup fills to that point, they've done that. Yeah, there are a couple then, of services. It releases everything, and. One person can donate the whole money, or ten yep. thousand can, or five million can. They don't really care. It's just as soon as it reaches that, and if it takes ten years to get to them, that's fine. I'll wait. There, there have been a couple yeah. services that have tried that. I don't think any have really caught on at all. Yeah. Um, I've seen a few of them, um, and I, you know, there may be lots of reasons why it doesn't catch on. Maybe people don't like that model, or maybe you know the companies that have done it just haven't. I, you know, I think it just feels ridiculous to the person who's giving the money because if you think about it, someone like um, what's her name, the really big. Uh, 
country music crossover to pop stars. Taylor, 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 Taylor Swift. Swift. God, I feel ridiculous. I knew her name. I just blanked uh-huh. for a moment. Taylor Swift. Imagine she put up her prize for her album. It would have to be something like, I want to make a hundred million dollars, and most right. people would look at that money and go, "Like, I'm not donating that to her." Well, to you make don't know. I mean, well, I, some of her fans. I mean, would, you but. have you have some real and and like you know, I go back to like like the Amanda Palmer Kickstarter that she did, at where yeah. you know she wanted like a hundred thousand dollars and ended up with one point three million, and you know people were donating like crazy, and you know at the same time, some people are arguing like, "Oh, you know why? You know why would people donate?" Yeah. Like, and mm. And yet, like when you watch, like the people who donated were so happy, like they were celebrating the fact mm-hmm. that she brought in 1.3 million and was able to create this. You know, it was like an event around her, right. you know creating this album, and they were excited to be a part of it. And that was more about inclusion. And as fans, they wanted to be included in part of the community. And it's not so much about the amount of money. Right. And and if you're not in that community, then it it seems ridiculous, right? So right. But that's just like anything. I, I think. It's amazing that Amanda Palmer has the fans that would that would um, donate that much and that would be happy for her <laughs> well, to, to do that. I don't and, know what that means. Well, yeah, well, well what, what I mean is, what that? I mean is, there's a lot of indie bands that yeah. have made sort of a point out of being the anti-money, right? Mm-hmm. And as long as they're just kind of making ends meet and not getting wealthy, that's fine. The minute they start making too yeah, much money, I think, they, I, see, see, I'm telling you there's a backlash. And I think that's probably part of what she experienced when you said people were complaining about it. There's sort no, of a no, backlash. No, she's never been that way. She's, she's Right. So she's never been that way. And, and she's been very open about mm-hmm. this, like, you know, asking for money if you want me to do this. And she, the, the difference is the real issue with, and I think lots of people say that, but I think the reality is if you connect with a community, and they want to support you, and it's part of being a community. Nobody cares about the amount. And it was the same thing when, when Louis C.K. did his, uh, yeah. you know, download my concert for five dollars and just made it really easy, yeah. DRM free, and he just put up a thing. I that, bought it. It was great. Yeah, and I bought it too. And it was just kind of like I'm not putting DRM on this. I'm just making it easy. Like it's just me. Like if you want to support me, support me. And then like you know, a week later, he posted a screenshot of his PayPal account with a million dollars in it, and everyone got really excited, and people weren't like, oh, that guy, he doesn't deserve a million dollars. Because you're part of something. It was people were a a part of it. And and so I think, you know, yeah, some people argue like, oh, like sell out, make too much money or whatever, but like Mm -hmm. if you build a a supportive community and, and it's sort of real and honest... I think people get excited about the success more than than they, you know, freak out about the amount of money. And I also think actually it's probably will encourage celebrities to behave better because you can't be an asshole after yep. that, right? Because if you're um, an asshole, you're not going to Unless gonna make that's much. your brand. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. No, unless some that's people your brand. Could, could build a, a brand around being an asshole. Some people certainly like, have. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 it's successful. But um I know we're we're running out of time, but I I want to discuss, I mean, so we sort of discussed like Straight up crowdfunding Kickstarter style and some like Patreon kind of thing. We discussed sort of the prizes, but th- those are just sort of the two things. We haven't, you know, d- are, are there any other models that, that people think about? Um, I mean, so I'll just, you know, I can throw, you know, with with products, with physical products, they're still just selling the damn products, right? <laughs> That's physical, yeah. Right, that's I mean, in, and you can argue that you need intellectual property for it, but I don't necessarily think that's true in a lot of cases, right? I mean, if you are the, you know, if you make the best mousetrap or whatever, people, you know, and and right now we have lots of products that are sold that don't have any patents on them or don't have any patents on them anymore, and they still sell because, I mean, fashion products, products, right, are, are sure. not co- not covered a lot by intellectual property, right. Clothing is, they do is a big well. one. Yeah, yeah. You, you still need trademark though to protect the fact that uh, Tra- you, trademark consumer, is consumer but, protection, right? So if sense. you look at trademark solely as consumer protection, then that's fine, yeah. right? If it's not about blocking out competition, then I, you know, then that's that's a different issue. But right. So I mean, if we're just talking about you know business models that don't require patents or tra- or copyrights, I, I think there's there's there are plenty of options. No, I think absolutely with physical products. I mean, I think there's there's uh, even even when people's patents have expired for a particular high quality product that they've mm-hmm. innovated and brought to the market, they still have that halo for some t- period of time where they can continue to sell a premium priced product because people see them as a market leader, as innovative uh, people, and so 
Um, even when cl cheaper clones come in the market, people aren't necessarily migrating to the cheaper clones right. immediately. It takes some time. You I mean, like like generic generic drugs. Like you know, I think yep. Advil still does an okay bit, but I mean, it's also yep. hard, right? So like I I have Costco brand. Yeah, whatever, and so it, it cuts the margin, but that's it does cut that, the margin. But but from a societal perspective, that's still good. But but actually, if you look at even yeah. where there are generic drugs, they can still charge a premium, and it's, yeah, they still can charge a premium. But that the, when a generic when a drug goes from being on patent to off patent, absolutely, the profitability goes way down. The margin way down. goes way down, no yeah. doubt. But yeah. they still do make yeah. a profit, right? And they can still charge a premium because there's a brand. There's a, yeah. a, a, a you know the the branding makes a difference. Now and and then just to to bring up, I mean, there are other things too that we've sort of ignored, like the more historical things. You know, for musicians, touring and concerts was you know a way that many of them made you know, large sums of money that had nothing to do with, with copyright protection. Um, you know, yeah. restaurants do re fine without copyright sure. protection, right? So of like recipes or whatnot. So, yeah. And, and so there's, there's, there, there, I think there are, you know, lots of ways. And I think many of those carry over into the modern world. Where Service businesses do particularly well. Right, because that's that's a case where you have a scarcity, right? A service yeah. business is is going to be a, a scarcity, um, and I mean, going back to 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 my silly formula right, that <laughs> that I was talking about for years was just you know you focus on figuring out what are the things that are scarce uh, and what are the things that are um, abundant, and you you know let the abundant stuff sort of be free and act as promotion and marketing and you focus on selling the scarce things. And that can be, you know, attention, appearance, physical products, all different things. And I think you can create a whole bunch of different business models out of that as well. There was an interesting business model that someone broached at a cryptocurrency meetup where they were talking about um, funding bands uh -huh. by issuing cryptocurrencies for the bands sure. right, when they're starting out. Um, there would be a limited amount of the cryptocurrency, but the purchasing power of the cryptocurrency would go up as the band got more famous. So there'd right. be an incentive for people to come in early. Now, I didn't quite understand what they meant by the fame of the band or the popularity of the band um, increasing along, along with the value of the cryptocurrency. I don't know how those things were tied together. That part eluded me. Um, but perhaps if you guys put your heads together, you'll figure it out. I haven't been able to. <laughs> but, uh, but maybe it just comes from the fact that, that uh, like Bitcoin or, or I guess for like fiat currency, the value of a currency is in the eye of the beholder to some extent. And so maybe just the popularity of the band, if everyone thinks the currency is to get more valuable, then it perhaps just is. Well, I mean, it, it could point. just be supply and demand too, right? I mean, if you have yeah. the limited supply and the cryptocurrency includes additional other benefits like access to the band or mm -hmm. access to the music or something like that, you could see where the value could, could increase pretty rapidly. So maybe maybe it should be called crypto tokens. Then. They're, they're, sure, they're like undivisible. Be. And if you have a token, you can always get into their concerts or meet them or something like that. And if there's only a thousand... And yeah, they would get more and more valuable as there's yeah, as the and that's I mean sort of related to that without even going into the cryptocurrency thing, you know, fan clubs, mm -hmm. you know, where if you're a member of of a particular fan club for a band and you get extra features and you know first access to tickets and shows or private shows or you know uh, t-shirts or things like that, you know th that's been a really good business for a lot of bands and you know and they've done you know some bands have done really interesting things where. You know, the longer you've been in the fan club, the more advantages you get, which encourages people to get in early and to stick around. And but, so. but those things aren't formalized or sort of uh, made concrete in any way, and I think so that's probably what, why it's some, not as Some of them are. Be. Some of them are. Mm. Um, some bands have definitely definitely done that. But S Someone needs to start a website like Kickstarter, but it's all about fan clubs for bands where they put the, certain uh, things in stone, like contractual. Some, some of them you. have. There, there is. I forget. There is a site that, that does that. I think there have been a few sites that have tried yeah. to do that. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, I think it's a really interesting, inter interesting space. But I also think that we are running out of time. Um, but if you, the listener, have other ideas on other non-patent, non-copyright business models, let us know. Uh, you can email us or, um, you know, comment on the on the on SoundCloud or on TechDirt. Um, probably TechDirt is better if you can. And, uh, and let us know. And I'm sure we'll have more to discuss on this in the future. And we'll have more podcasts next week. So thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Hirsch. Thank you, listeners. We'll be back. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.
grab a shovel and dig up the tap. Duh. If we don't stand up to them, someone will get hurt. To grab a shovel and dig up the tap. Duh. If we don't stand up to them, someone will get hurt. To grab a shovel and dig up the tap.